grab your favorite SD card and let's get to installing. Howdy everybody, Steve here, KM9G. Man, it is cold outside, so I am in the shack today bringing you part two of the ADSB Go Box. This is the kit where we're gonna put everything inside of a nice little orange case that is weatherproof and eye-catching, so people go, what is that? And then I can brag about how awesome ham radio is and how we can pick up radio signals from the atmosphere and build really cool things like this. And let's get over to the bench and make awesome happen. As always, there will be links in the description down below for all of this stuff, as well as any gotchas or weird stuff that comes up, any anomalies that come up. It works on the Raspberry Pi 3, 4, 0, 2W, and on the old-fashioned zero, the slow, slow zero as long as you disable the graphs. We've got the antennas installed. We've got the USB hub installed on the Raspberry Pi 0 2W. We've got the SDR dongles installed. So all we need now is software. Download this image from ADSB exchange slash my IP slash download slash blah, blah, blah. This one is 9-10-2022. It looks like is the date version 8.2. So click on that. You're gonna get a box that pops up asking you to save it somewhere. Save it somewhere memorable to you because that's the important thing is that you remember where you saved your file to. Once you have that saved, we need to go over and download the Raspberry Pi Imager. And it's a pretty neat little tool. If you haven't seen it before, it helps you burn SD cards with Raspberry Pi OSs as well as many, many, many other OSs like the one we're going to install today. So if we click on the software tab, the first thing that pops up is that Imager and I am running this on Mac OS. So I'm gonna to need to download the version for Mac OS, but there is a Windows version and Ubuntu version. And there's also a Raspberry Pi OS version, all you have to do is launch a command terminal and type in apt install rpi imager and you're good to go from there. So we'll download it for Mac OS, same drill, it's gonna pop up a dialog box, we need to remember where we saved it. And then once you have it saved, it's as easy as dragging this from the file that you downloaded over into the applications folder. And in my case, I already have it installed, so it's asking me if I want to keep both, stop or replace. I'm gonna replace it just in case this is a newer version. So now we launch the Raspberry Pi imager and it asks us if we'd like to launch the program that we just went through all the trouble to download and install and launch. And and yes, we, we do want to do the thing that we went through all that trouble to do. Thank you for being extra secure, Mac OS. And here it is. So we need to choose OS. And I'm going to use custom. It's the option at the bottom of the list. And we need to navigate to the folder where we downloaded the image file from step one and pick this. You don't have to unzip it or anything. You just pick the file and go. And then we need to choose storage. And I put a 32 gig SD card in, 32 gig SD card pops up. It knows that it's mass storage and not my internal drive. So a little bit of safety there. So I do that and then I click on write. All existing data will be erased. Yep, it wants my admin password and we're writing and we're verifying and we're continuing and we're quitting the Raspberry Pi imager. And we're gonna stop doing that. Insert your SD card into your cobbled together ADSB exchange information receiver device. And you do not have to plug in the video display. I'm just doing it here for the purposes of the install, but it will boot up the first time. It will resize the file system to take up the entire space on the SD card. It will reboot itself. And then we'll be back in business looking for the Wi-Fi adapter. Standby one. Let's see what happens when we do our first boot. There's our rainbow. Resize root file system, rebooting. Rainbow number two. So when it boots up this time, it is going to try and find a Wi-Fi network. It's not going to find one. It's gonna make its own Wi-Fi network and we need to connect to that. Okay, and we're back over to our Mac OS machine and I'm gonna drop down the Wi-Fi choices menu and now we have this ADSB X config. This is only gonna be up for about 15 minutes after first boot. We are now connected to this and we need to find out where that is, 172.23.45.1 works for me, or you can also do ADSB exchange.local, which didn't work for me, and it pops up. We are on 8.2.220910, so September 10th of 2022. I was gonna say 1922. And the first thing that we should do is just go through this. These green pieces here are informational, and then these gray ones here are your settings. Fairly straightforward. We're gonna configure the Wi-Fi. Choose a Wi-Fi network. And that's going to give me a drop down list of the Wi Fi networks that the Raspberry Pi sees. Lakeland Monitoring Station is mine. There we go. That was a little flaky. So I tried it with the mouse, that didn't work. So then I tried it with the arrow keys. Let's put in our Wi Fi password and then we will hit the submit button. And it reboots itself when you do that. And while it's doing the reboot, this is a little fake timer. It's pretty neat. Uh, it's not really doing anything other than letting that GIF advance across the screen for you. Then it will hope to try and reconnect to itself. 
I don't know how it's going to do that because I'm using an IP address that I'm no longer connected to. I need to switch back to my own Wi-Fi network if I haven't already, which I have. So we're good to go there. Let's see how the boot up is going. And it is ready to go. So as you can see, it gives us the IP address. You can go to adsbexchange.local or you can go to 192.168, whatever, whatever is the address that gets assigned on your machine. And here we are. This page looks really familiar, doesn't it? Because it's the one that we were just on. You just walk right down through the steps here. Fairly easy, fairly straightforward. The guys have done a fantastic job making this software. I'm going to configure the receiver location and it's going to want precise latitude. Later on in the series, we're going to figure out a way to get this information off of a GPS receiver. And that's cool because there are three USB ports on this device. So the third one will probably be used for a GPS receiver, but we'll see, we'll get there. And they give us a link. This site can be used to determine your lat lawn on gr and ground altitude. Excellent, because we need all three of those things. So I'm gonna click on that. It's gonna open in a new tab and I need to find myself. Hmm. DuckDuckGo blocked content to prevent Facebook from tracking you. Thank you. Let's zoom in here and I am in Luck, Wisconsin. Let's go to the pharmacy as our location. And then if we scroll down on the page, we have our latitude. So we'll copy that and we will paste it. And then we need our longitude. Copy that and paste it. Verify coordinates. That seems to be nowhere. <laughs> so maybe I put those in backwards. Let's close this and swap directions. No, I put those in right. Ah, oh, that's why. It didn't paste the right number the second time. So let's do that again. Verify coordinates. Hey, that looks that looks right this time. Okay, so now I need to do the altitude, and that was also on this page. It is 1,223.8 feet. So let's go in and paste that. And then we need to give this device a name. I'm going to call this ADSBX underscore TO and then the MLAT marker within five mile random five mile offset. That's fine. Using 1090. Yes. 1090 gain setting. Yes, that'll be fine. And it will adjust itself automatically every 24 hours. Enable the 978. Yes, because we have that. Allow ADSB exchange staff to access this unit remotely. No. Allow zero tier service without remote support. No, I don't like remote people being able to log in. Use custom LED indications. Yeah, why not? It's going to be inside the box. The box is hopefully going to be closed. So nobody will see it, but why not? Enable the graphs 1090. This is an awesome feature. Yes, you want this if you have a 02W or better machine. So I'm going to save and restart the services. Please match the requested format. Oh, it doesn't want decimals. Please match the requested format. It's a good thing they checked that. Yes, I'd like to save and restart. And now we're doing the save and restart thing. And it looks like it's just restarting the web interface and the software behind the scenes and not actually restarting the Raspberry Pi. And we're back. That was pretty fast. Assign SDRs to services. Choose an SDR serial number for the 1090. And this is actually where it's really slick. So it has figured out which dongles are which that are plugged in and it has named them appropriately to make this super easy for us. So this is 1090 for the 1090. And this is 978 for the 978. And then the gain for the 978 is 42.1. We're going to save and restart the services again. And then they want us to visit the link to verify changes, which is where it's going to take us anyway. And we're back. We did that. Change the password, update, and reboot. And we are going to need to change the password. This is going to be a public device, and a public device with a well-known password is not a good idea. So we're going to put in the well-known password. ADSB123. And then we're going to give it a super secret password. This is the one that's automatically generated by Firefox. I'm not going to use that one. And then we're going to change the password. Yes, save that. Your password has been changed. Click here to log in. Authenticate. System is unlocked. We're back to the password change page. Let's go back to the main menu. System info. Some pretty cool stats for nerds in there. All right, that's enough of that because, ta-da, it's working. Let's look at some of the graphs that we have. So here is our 1090 graph, and I have one airplane so far. I've, I've got two in the history. Oh, there's two on the screen now. And this is just starting to gather some data, and this is Saturday afternoon, so there's probably plenty of flights going overhead right now. The longer you let this run, the more data you will have. So let's go back to our menu. What we'll do is I will come back here in a bit after I have some more data and we'll talk some more. That install was ridiculously easy, but here's the results. You can see 
Ooh, I put it right. You can see all of these airplanes over here that are tracking. I do have persistence turned on because I am running a small antenna indoors and that's not the ultimate setup, but I just wanted to make sure that this thing worked and we got some data out of it. Even with the little tiny antenna sitting in the house, I still have plenty of coverage. I'm in Luck, Wisconsin. You can kind of see the little dot here on the map where all these Cessnas are, are kind of swarming overhead. I'm kind of, I'm kind of worried. Um, and then you can see the, the coverage area. And this is coverage of signals received from airplanes. So this is actually like legitimately, I was able to pick up a signal all the way out here on Lake Superior and all the way over here. And not bad at all. When we get outside and we get some better elevation and we get and we get and we get and we get, this ought to be an even better radiation pattern. So that's going to be something to look forward to in an upcoming video. Once we get the case design, I'm going to stick it outside with the battery in it and let it run until the battery dies because we got to test that kind of stuff out too. So this is the 1090 megahertz antenna. We've got both of them on here. We've got the 1090 and the 978. It is 978, right? Hey, I got that right too. Yeah, so we got the 1090 and we've got the 978. This is the 1090 and this is the 978. There's not as many airplanes that are reporting ACARS data, but it is there and it is being received. And so we do have some data from that as well. And then one of the really cool things about this, this is where it looks like they just went down the rabbit hole and tried to give you every bit of information possible, is these graphs. These graphs are amazing. So we've got ADSB message rate here from the last 24 hours, and we could go back to the last 10 years if I was actually doing this for 10 years. But this is the last 24 hours, lots and lots of data. So you can see messages received, min, max, seven day average, messages greater than negative three DBFS, which is 14% of the messages and positions per second. So amount of positions reported, aircraft seen and tracked, uh, ADSB track seen, ADSB range. So it looks like we're getting out to, that's a, that's a Firefox plugin that's popping those pictures out for us. But it looks like, uh, I don't know, 65 miles on a little rubber duck indoors. Not bad at all. Signal level, strength in DBFS, the ADSB maxima, uh, the ADSB message rate, and the CPU utilization. So this is a Raspberry Pi 02W, and there's not a whole lot of CPU utilization going on. So we're at 22% CPU, so there's still a little bit of room. 22% is a good, a good sweet spot. You start get, getting up to around 50 and you might start to feel it a little bit, but 22 is fantastic. If there is some stuff that you can think about that we might also want to do with this machine while it's out there being eye-catching in all of the, the fantastic places I'm going to travel to and record flight data, let me know in the comments down below. Otherwise, make sure you are subscribed to the channel so that you can catch the next iteration in this series. Next up, we're going to put it into the go box and figure out some battery solutions. So be sure to be subscribed for that. Ring the bell for notifications for when that video comes out. There is a video right, nope, there's a video right over here I think you will enjoy next. Thanks for being awesome. I'll be over there waiting for you.